let's continue our study of compactness of topological spaces. A topological space X is said to be compact if and only if every open cover has a finite subcover. That is, for every open cover U alpha, where the alphas are indexed on some set A, there exists a finite subset A0 of that indexing set, such that the U alphas for alpha in A0 form an open cover of X. That is to say, if X can be written as a union of these U alphas, which are all open, then there's a finite subset of them, such that X can be written as the same union over the finite subset. Let's now look at a kind of complementary way to look at compactness, which is the following. If we have a topological space and we have a collection of closed subsets, then we say that that collection of closed subsets satisfies the finite intersection property. If and only if, for every finite subset A0 of A, the intersection is non-empty. So if every finite subset of these Z alphas intersects to be non-empty, then we say that these Z alphas have the finite intersection property. And now using this, we can characterize compactness in a new way. And here's the theorem. The theorem says that the following are equivalent for a topological space X. One, that X is compact. And two, that for every collection of closed subsets that satisfies the finite intersection property, then the intersection of all of the Z alphas is non-empty. In other words, if you have a collection of closed subsets such that any finite intersection of them is non-empty, then the intersection of all of them is non-empty. I suggest proving this theorem as an exercise. Let's also recall that we have a characterization of compactness for subspaces of Euclidean space. This was the Heine-Borel theorem. And that stated that the following are equivalent for a subspace of Euclidean space. First, that X is compact. And second, that X is closed and bounded. Today we're going to give another characterization of compact subspaces of Euclidean space, and that's called the bolzano weierstrass theorem. So the following are equivalent for a subspace of Euclidean space. First, that X is compact. And second, that every sequence of points of X has a convergent subsequence. Convergent in this case meaning that it converges to a point of X. Okay, so let's prove this theorem. We'll begin by proving that the negation of 2 implies the negation of 1. In other words, suppose that we have a sequence xi of our space x with no convergent subsequence. Then we can select open balls centered at each of the points of the sequence with some radius that don't contain any of the other points of that sequence. That's exactly what it means to have no convergent subsequence. Furthermore, since this sequence has no convergent subsequence, the subset consisting of the points of the sequence is closed. There are no other points of X that are close to our Z. Consequently, I can take the singleton, XI, and write that as the intersection of Z 
and the ball that I picked that doesn't contain any other point of my sequence. And this is going to be open in Z. Well, if the singletons are open, then that means that Z must be the discrete topological space. But the only discrete compact topological spaces are finite. But Z here is a sequence, so it's infinite. So that means that Z can't be compact. On the other hand, we just said that Z is closed inside X. If X were compact, then any closed subset of it would be compact as well. And since Z isn't compact, but it is closed in X, that implies that X is not compact. Good, so this proves that 1 implies 2, or equivalently, that not 2 implies not 1. Let's now prove that not 1 implies not 2. So if x is not compact, then there are two options. Either x is not closed in this Euclidean space, or else x is not bounded. Either way, what we want to do is to construct a sequence that has no convergent subsequence. Well, if x is not closed, then we can select a point of Rn that isn't in x that is nevertheless close to x. And then we can simply construct a sequence that converges to x such that every point of that sequence is contained in our subspace x. Okay, that's the first option. The other option is that x is not bounded. If x is not bounded, then we can construct a sequence in x whose distance from the origin increases without bound. Such a sequence has no hope of converging, so that'll be a sequence without a convergent subsequence. Here's an observation about compactness. If you have a set, x, with two topologies, tau1 and tau2, and if x with tau1 is compact, and if tau2 is coarser than tau1, Remember, coarser means that you have fewer open sets. Then x with a tau2 topology is also compact. Now the goal is to pair our notion of compactness with the notion that works kind of as a complementary notion, which is the notion of Hausdorffness. Here's the definition. Let x be a topological space. Then we say that x is Hausdorff if and only if, for every pair of distinct points of x, there exist disjoint open neighborhoods, u of x and v of y. Notice that this works in the opposite direction from the notion of compactness. If we have a set with two topologies, tau1 and tau2, if x2 is Hausdorff and tau2 is coarser than tau1, then x1 is Hausdorff as well. Here are some examples of Hausdorff topological spaces. Well, first, any discrete space is Hausdorff automatically. After all, the singletons are open sets in a discrete topological space. Euclidean space is Hausdorff. More generally, any metric space is Hausdorff. Any subspace of a Hausdorff topological space is automatically Hausdorff. Here's the first lemma that relates Hausdorffness and compactness. So if we have a Hausdorff topological space, X, and we have a subspace of X that's compact, then it is necessarily closed as a subset of X. Here's the proof. Suppose that I take a point in the complement. 
what I'd like to do is I'd like to construct an open neighborhood of this point that doesn't intersect Z. If I do that, then I will have shown that Z is in fact closed. Now for every point of Z, little z, what can I do? I can construct little neighborhoods, u and v, of x and z respectively. So u will be an open neighborhood of x, and v will be an open neighborhood of z, and these two will not intersect. So these will be disjoint open neighborhoods of z and x. And what I notice straight away is that if I intersect these neighborhoods of z, all of them for all the possible z's, with z itself, then that produces for me an open cover of z. Now we're assuming that z is compact, so that means that there's a finite collection of points, z1 through zn, such that z is contained in the union of the vz's. And this is a finite union, critically. We're going to use that finiteness on the other side with these uz's, and we're going to intersect that finite collection of open neighborhoods together. A finite intersection of open sets is open, and this is really critically where we're using the finiteness. This u here is open. And since by design we've arranged for the uzi's and the vzi's to be disjoint, it follows that u itself is disjoint from z because after all z sits inside the union of these and u is the intersection of these. What does that mean? That means that u is now an open neighborhood of x that's completely disjoint from z. That's just what we wanted to show. That proves now that z is closed. So inside a Hausdorff topological space, a compact subspace is necessarily closed. Let's use that lemma in the following way. Suppose that I have a set X with two topologies, tau1 and tau2. And let's assume that X tau1 is Hausdorff and X tau2 is compact. So tau1 is Hausdorff and tau2 is compact. Now if tau1 is coarser than or equal to tau2, then it must be equal to tau2. In other words, there's no way for tau1 to be strictly coarser than tau2. In other words, there's no way for a Hausdorff topology to be strictly coarser than a compact topology on the same set. And here's the proof. I need to show that anything that is closed for the topology T2 will be closed for the topology T1. So let's do that. Let's take Z to be T2 closed. And well, in the topology T2, I know that X is compact. So closed things are compact in the T2 subspace topology. So our Z here is compact. And since tau1 is coarser than tau2, it follows that Z is also compact with the tau1 subspace topology. Because again, if you have a compact space and you take a coarser topology on it, then that coarser topology will also be compact. So Z is also compact in the tau1 subspace topology. But tau1 is Hausdorff as a topology. That means that Z is compact as a subspace of a Hausdorff topological space, and as we've just seen, those are always closed subsets. Here's a picture of the universe of topologies on a fixed set S. So in this region here, 
we're looking at all the compact topologies that you could possibly put on a set X. Here, for example, is the chaotic or indiscrete topology, which is always compact. And as we see, if you become coarser and you're compact, then you'll remain compact. In a similar vein, here's the world of the Hausdorff topologies. And if you take a topology and you take a finer topology, if the first topology is Hausdorff, then the second one will be as well. And at the extreme here is the discrete topology, which is certainly Hausdorff. And there are some topologies on a set that might be neither compact nor Hausdorff. For the moment, we're going to think of these as simply the strange topologies or the wacky topologies. So we're going to be mostly focused on the topologies that are sort of in this space. And furthermore, you can't have a Hausdorff topology that is strictly coarser than a compact topology on the same set. So that means there's this sweet spot that's formed right along here consisting of the compact Hausdorff topologies. These are the ones that have the best of both worlds, and this sort of forms a kind of slice through this space of topologies. So compact Hausdorff spaces are quite exceptional, and we'll see that they have a lot of really good properties. Now onto a proposition. Let's say that we have two topological spaces, X and Y, and suppose that we have a continuous map between them. Then, if X is compact and Y is Hausdorff, then F, our continuous map, is closed. That is, if Z is a closed subset of X, then its image in Y is closed as well. This isn't the sort of thing that you'd expect of a general continuous map, but it does happen if the source is compact and the target is Hausdorff. Let's see how to prove this. Well, if we have a closed subset of our X, then it's necessarily compact. One of the first things we learned about compact spaces is that continuous images of compact spaces are compact. Therefore, it follows that the image F of Z is compact. But since Y is Hausdorff and F of Z is compact, it follows that F of Z is also closed. But that exactly means that the image of this closed subset is closed inside Y. What does this mean for us? Well, it means, for example, that if we happen to have a compact topological space mapping to a Hausdorff topological space, and let's say that it's mapping via a continuous surjection, then this F will automatically be a quotient map. Remember, in general, a continuous surjection might not be a quotient map. But in this particular example, if we have X compact and Y Hausdorff, then it's guaranteed to be a quotient map. In particular, if F is a continuous bijection from our compact topological space to our Hausdorff topological space, then it is automatically a homeomorphism. This is nice because it means that we're saved from the problem of having to write down the inverse map to our bijection and prove that that also is continuous. Here it's sufficient just to know that if the source is compact and the target is Hausdorff, then a continuous bijection is automatically a homeomorphism. Finally, here's a proposition that shows us that inside a Hausdorff topological space, the compact subspaces are in a sense quite like points. So remember that in a Hausdorff topological space, if you have two points that are distinct, then there are little open neighborhoods that we can draw around each of them that are disjoint. The same thing happens for compact subspaces. That is, for any two compact subspaces, K and L, of our Hausdorff topological space X, if K and L are disjoint, then there are open subsets U and V that contain K and L respectively that are also disjoint. So the proof involves 
playing this compactness game that we saw last time. So let's begin by just choosing two points, one of K and one of L, and we see that there are disjoint open neighborhoods, I'll call them UXY of X and VXY of Y. So I have these disjoint open neighborhoods, and since L is compact, for every fixed X in K, I can find a finite set, Y1 through YN, of points of my L, such that, well, if I write V of X to be the union of that finite collection of opens, then L will be contained in it. Here I'm using the compactness of L. And so just as we saw before, we're going to take the intersection of these U, X, Y's, the corresponding things that are subsets of, or that are open neighborhoods of my X, and I'll intersect those together. Since this is a finite intersection, my UX is still open. So now I have UX, which is an open neighborhood of X, and I have VX, which is an open neighborhood of the entire compact space L, and these two sets don't intersect. Now I'm going to work the other way. I have an open neighborhood UX that is disjoint from VX, and VX completely contains L, and UX just contains X. So I have one of these for every single X, and since K is also compact, that means that there's a finite collection of points, X1 through XM, such that I can write U as the union of those, and V as the intersection of the Vs, and K will be contained in U, and well, since L was contained in each one of these, L will be contained in their intersection. And since I've unioned the U's and intersected the V's, it'll still be the case that the intersection is empty. So here's a picture of this proof in action. Over here, I'll have a picture of my K, and over here, I'll have a picture of my L. These are the two boxes that you see here. And I have a point of K, and I have points of L that I can contemplate. And well, what can happen? So I can write down for every pair an open neighborhood that's V, X, Y, 1, this one's V, X, Y, 2, and this one's V, X, Y, 3. And I have corresponding open neighborhoods of my X here that are disjoint from the open neighborhoods of the YIs. What does that mean? Well, for example, here's V, X, Y, 1. If I want to see what U, X, Y, 1 does, maybe it does something like this. I don't rule out the possibility that it could intersect with some of these others, but it mustn't intersect with this one. So this, for example, is a good picture of a U, X, Y, 1. Now, because L is compact, only a finite collection of these V, X, Y's will suffice to cover L. So that means that I can look at the corresponding U, X, Y's and intersect them. And because finite intersections of open sets are still open, I'll end up with an open neighborhood of my X. So if I union the corresponding VXYs together, then I'll get something that is open and contains my L. And if I intersect the corresponding UXYs, then I'll get something that is open and contains my X. So that gives me the ability to separate a point from a compact set. And I can separate every single point of K from this compact set L. And since K is compact, I can do that for just some finite collection of points in my K. And that'll give me an open set that contains K and is disjoint from an open set that contains L. That's the structure of this argument.